Hi everyone, I'm Kirtland, and I'm, a, I'm currently a fourth year undergrad at UC Berkeley. And so today I'll be talking about my most recent work on most model-based reinforcement learning, which I've been working on in collaboration with my mentors, Roberto Calandra, Rowan McAllister, and Professor Sergey Levin. So what is reinforcement learning? So for those of you who are not familiar, reinforcement learning is a general framework for learning how to solve tasks that are simply specified by reward functions. And so what you usually have is you have an agent that can perform actions in the world. As a consequence of that action, the agent receives an updated observation of the world, as well as a reward signal telling it how, how well it's doing on the task it's supposed to be performing. And so then the objective of your agent is to maximize the sum of rewards it sees on a single trajectory. And so why is this useful? And so ultimately, it's it's quite difficult to specify how exactly we want to do a task, as in what sequence of actions we need to take, but it's much easier to specify how we want the world to look after completing the task. And so what reinforcement learning does for us is that now we can simply specify the reward function, and then it's up to the agent to find the sequence of actions that will solve your task. And so, Reinforcement learning has been success successfully applied to several domains, including video games, board games, as well as real robotic environments. And so that's nice, but how do we actually achieve this goal? And so there are several approaches to reinforcement learning. And so the most basic one that you could probably think of is since we want to solve a task, we want to figure out, given that we're currently in some state, how we should act in that state to move towards your goal. And so the f that approach corresponds to something called policy gradients, which is essentially learning a policy, which is a mapping from current state to how you should act. And so examples of this include PPO and TRPO. An extension of this is something called actor critic, where in, in, in addition to having a policy, you also have a network which tells you how you have another network called a critic, which essentially tells you the long-term value of a pair of state and action to the goal that you're trying to achieve. And finally, you have a final approach, which is slightly orthogonal to these other two, called model-based RL. And so in model-based RL, you're essentially learning a model of how the world works, so essentially the dynamics, instead of learning the policy directly. And then using that model, you can then plan how you achieve your task. And so these methods generally fall in a spectrum of how efficient they are in using the data that they obtain from the environment. So policy gradient methods tend to be less efficient compared to model-based RL methods. And so the intuition behind this is that model-based RL is forced to learn an association between states to next states. So it has to fit a multivariate vector compared to the other two methods, which are simply reliant on a single scalar reward signal. And so how well do these approaches actually work? So we have this task called the half cheetah task, where essentially your goal is to walk forwards. And so for, as we see here, we have a policy gradient method in purple called PPO, as well as a model-based RL method in orange by Nagabandi et al. And so we see that in the limited data regime, model-based RL does really well, and it learns quite quickly. But if we look at the overall performance in the long run, we see that PPO eventually outperforms model-based RL. But at what cost? So if we look at how long it takes to get to where it converges, we see that it requires eight hours of interaction with the actual environment. And so in certain cases, this is not exactly feasible. And so then this raises the question, how could we improve model-based RL methods while retaining the data efficiency that they promise? And so the way we approach this problem for this work is we consider the question of model bias. And so model bias is essentially, essentially boils down to the issue that when you're planning, you're forced to completely trust your model even though you know that it will probably be wrong in some part of your state space. And so our work essentially tries to modify the standard model-based RL framework in a way that accounts for this model bias. And so before I could go get into how we did that, we, I have to 
talk about how model-based RL is usually done. And so in model-based RL, what you usually do is you have a dynamics model, which you learn from some data set, and then you use that model when you're interacting with the environment in, you can, in this specific way. So there are multiple ways to do this. For example, you could train a policy, but in our particular method, we use something called model predictive control. And so the way that works is that at every time step of your interaction, you sample several action sequences, and then you use a model to imagine what will happen to the world if you apply each action, action sequence in isolation. And then, using those predictions, you just take whichever action sequence led to the best predicted feature, you take the first action, and then you go back and replan. And so once you're done interacting with the environment, you just go back to your dynamics model and you retrain using your new transition data that you've obtained from the interaction. And so um, since we are addressing the issue of model bias, we have to look at what we can do to improve the model. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. And so in prior work, what's usually done is that you have a neural network which maps a pair of state action to the next state. And so on the right, I have an illustration of what this might look like on some toy function. So black is ground truth, um, green is what the neural network predicts, and red are the red points are the train possibly noisy samples from your ground truth function. And so as you can see here, the model is actually quite good at modeling what the function will do in regions where we have training data. But if we look at example, uh, for example, to the left or to the right, the model is actually really bad at modeling what the ground truth function is actually doing. And so this illustrates the issue of model bias because Imagine that you're an agent planning with this possibly faulty model, and so you're forced to completely rely on the faulty predictions predicted by your model, and so you, you'll ultimately end up with suboptimal planning. And so we propose two changes to remedy this issue. And so the first thing we do is instead of having a single point prediction, we can have the network predict a distribution over the next state instead. And so what that lets us do is that now the model can tell us a measure of how, the, how noisy the environment actually was. And so then we can take that into account when we're planning. The second thing that we propose, though, is we can, take, we can form an ensemble of these networks and train them on different subsets of the data. And so the proposal to have the network output distributions is nice in that it lets us plan under noisy environments, but it doesn't resolve the issue completely. Because if you look at just the green curve, even if, if it gives us predict estimates of how noisy the environment is, there's still no way to determine whether the model is actually trustworthy in that region of the state space. But if we have multiple models, we can then have a measure of how good the model actually is. So in this example, we see that the models generally agree where you have training data, but outside the training data, the models diverge in their predictions. And so this divergence gives us a measure of how bad the model actually is in modeling that transition. And so then this measure of uncertainty can be taken into account during the planning process, reducing this issue of model bias. And so now we have this new model, which we call a probabilistic ensemble. And then, we, since we have a new model, we also have to change how we use this model in planning. And so I'll go over that next. And so this method is something we call trajectory sampling. And so with prior methods, since the network is deterministic, each action sequence corresponds to exactly one trajectory that you can get in the environment according to your model. But since your model is now probabilistic, each action sequence induces a distribution over what trajectories you can get. And a nice thing that would be a nice thing is if we could get this distribution over trajectories analytically. But since neural networks in general are quite intractable, um, we'd have to settle for sampling from this distribution instead. So to do the sampling, what we do is say we're currently at this state in the world. 
what we do is we duplicate this state several times. So for example, in this case, we have three. And for each duplicate, we pass it through one of the models in our ensemble. And so each ensemble predicts a distribution over where the particle could go next. And so what we then do is we sample from these distributions. And now we have these predicted transitions by se several models in the ensemble. And now the idea is to just simply cascade these predictions over and over until we arrive at the planning horizon. And that gives us a sample over the distribution of trajectories we could have. And now, with these samples, we can simply calculate the reward over each one, average, and that gives us an expected reward of a given action sequence. And so now we have the probabilistic ensemble model, and we have a method of incorporating the uncertainty information from your model to account for this issue of model bias. And so with these two modifications, we arrive at our method, which we call probabilistic ensembles with trajectory sampling, or PETs. And so, how well does our method do? And so in this plot, we have our method in blue, SAC, which is um, state of the art in terms of non-model-based RL methods, as well as a prior model-based RL method in orange, which, is, which was by Nagabandi et al. To make these results more concrete, I will show several videos of how our performance compared to the prior model-based RL method, as well as how much interaction time our method actually needs to solve the task of making the half cheetah move forward. So at the first iteration, we see that neither of the methods are making much progress. And this is true for the first five iterations. But if we look at the 10th trial, we see that our method is already starting to move forward, although not necessarily in the most efficient way. And if we do 20 trials in this case, we see that our method's already moving forward quite quickly, even though it's only interactive with the environment for seven minutes. And so in the 50th trial, which corresponds to 17 minutes, we have that our method's actually running quite fast. So if we consider our method at the 300th trial, we see that our method has been able to solve the task while find in a quite interesting way. <laughs> um, but, right, so, and furthermore, our method doesn't just solve the half cheetah, but is able to perform other tasks quite well. And so why should you use PETS? So PETS is data efficient, as been illustrated in the previous slides. It's competitive with other methods in terms of asymptotic performance, and it's quite easy to implement. So from the previous slides, all we had to do was take a single neural network model and duplicate it several times to get a measure of uncertainty and propagate several particles in parallel to incorporate this uncertainty information. And so ultimately, PETS is a simple way to deal with this issue of model bias, which holds model-based RL methods back, allowing it to retain the same data efficiency while being competitive with other methods. And so with that, um, thank you for listening to this talk. Here's relevant links, including the extended paper. And I'd like to thank all my mentors. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? So, so one quick question, actually. Um, you, you showed that you're generating trajectories by uh, applying, you know, one model uh, recursively. Yeah. Right. Uh, does it make a difference if you um, match different models, or if you make, you know, the, the first take prediction with one and then you switch to another one or? Um, so I've actually ran experiments trying both, but I didn't see significant differences. No difference. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. I have a question regarding the computational complexity of the um, yeah. planning model compared to, 
compared to the model free method that you showed. Yeah. Because the iteration, apparently, to me, it looks like is uh, shows the samples that you receive. Yeah. So mo these model free methods obviously are much cheaper. So I was wondering, how do you compare uh, the computation complexity? Right. In that so um, I found that you. So although um, the method. Our method is quite data efficient. It does require a decent amount of computation time because of the parallel sampling as well as the, um, like the basically, a big chunk of time is spent on predicting several particles in parallel. Right. right. So the eight times, the eight hours that you showed in the beginning, mm -hmm. so it would not be comparable, I guess. So um, yeah. So that more. measure was how much time it's spent in the environment, not the computational time. I, yeah. So uh, we, we now have you know, a, a new uh, break and a poster session. So I'd like to thank very much again uh, all the speakers of this session. <laughs>